So we're very happy to have here Eddie Ashford, who is an associate professor at the School of Media Arts and Studies at Ohio University, where he teaches music production and recording industry studies. He's a 25-year veteran of the music industry, having produced, recorded, or mixed a great variety of artists from Sublime to Dokken. Are you rocking my Dokken? That's what I want. You had to say that, didn't you? Yes. <laughs> um, from the sublime to the, no. anyway. to the ridiculous. Um, yeah. <laughs> He's a member of NARA and uh, Art Engineering Society, sits on the editorial board of the Journal of the Art of Record Production, and has received numerous platinum and gold sales awards. So please welcome Eddie F. Thank you. And thank you all for coming today. We truly appreciate it. I'm here to talk about the Guyana National Media Assessment Project. In May 2013, a team of faculty, staff, and graduate students from Ohio University traveled to Georgetown, Guyana to assess the content and condition of several collections of analog audio recordings held in the public sector. Working with uh, Guyanese archivists, librarians, and media professionals, the group inventoried a strategic sample of the over 14,000, and this is estimated at this point, 14,000 individual audio assets in these collections. Uh, of course, as most of you know who uh, have ever done this kind of work, it took a couple of years just to get this part of the project going, and it will take several more to uh, bring it to its ultimate, ultimate fruition. Uh, today, though, I'd like to share with you the genesis of the project, the tools and methodology we adapted and devised to deal with the unique working conditions in Georgetown, the results of our assessment, and the challenges facing future assessment and preservation work in Guyana. But first, a little bit about Guyana, um, which is, there we go, come on. Okay, there we go. Um, it, now, it's often confused with Ghana. This is one of the first things that people often ask me about, where, where in Africa is Guyana? <laughs> Uh, it is not in Africa, it's actually in South America on the uh, northeast coast uh, between Venezuela, Brazil, Suriname, and the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, as some of you probably know, it's a land with a long and turbulent past. Um, originally the home of nine groups of indigenous people, including the Arawak and the Carib. Uh, Guyana, Guyana was later ground zero for colonial expansion in the U.S. Uh, first the Dutch, then the Spanish, the Portuguese, and finally, the British all established a colonial presence here at one time or another, attracted by the area's strategic location at the mouth of the Essequibo River, which, by the way, is the largest river between the Orinoco and the Amazon, and suitability for growing tobacco, cacao, and later sugar, the latter a key component of the infamous triangle trade. During this period, African slaves worked the plantations and built the capital city of Georgetown, a uh, print of it there, in the 1800s and uh, built the uh, extensive system of canals and the famous seawall which girds the coastline of, of uh, Guyana. Um, most of the coastal area of Guyana is below sea level, so the Dutch um, famously built a seawall to keep the ocean out. So most of the country's population lives beneath sea level uh, in the coastal plain of Guyana. Uh, the seawall these days is also a very popular location uh, for gatherings and parties and things like that uh, during the modern era. Uh, with the, uh, eventually it became, uh, the British uh, gained dominion over uh, Guyana, and it became British Guyana. Um, with the abolition of slavery, the British brought in indentured servants from India, Java, Africa, China, and Portugal, um, with indentured servitude uh, being pretty much a euphemism for enhanced slavery as it's uh, uh, sometimes called. Um, with, with it, it's an unhappy chapter in the country's history, but is, it is this influx of people from many different uh, cultures and continents that has resulted in, in a more happy confluence of culture that is emblematic of today's Guyana. In 1966, Guyana gained its independence from Britain, and in 1970, formally became the Cooperative Republic of Guyana. It is a seat of CARICOM, which is a Caribbean community, sort of a a, you know, UN of the Caribbean Basin. It's the only non-island Caribbean uh, member of that body, by the way. It's also, incidentally, the sole country in South America uh, that where English is the main language. Say, say, say that 
It's the only country in South America where English is the main language. That that make get that? I thought there was another country that's a British country in, in South America. We, I don't know which one that one be. It starts with a B. <laughs> that that would be Central America. No, if, Central. Yeah. Okay. Great, Thank, thanks for clearing that up, appreciate that. Um, though it is blessed with significant uh, natural amenities, it contains a number of UNESCO World Heritage Sites, um, abundant agricultural and mineral riches, and uh, currently uh, it has a real gold rush going on in the country's interior. It also boasts significant uh, oil and other types of uh, energy deposits. The country has struggled to shake off the centuries of colonialism that has hobbled its emergence into the modern world economy. The bounty of the land's resources seldom reaches the average citizen. However, in spite of their struggles, uh, the people of Guyana are warm, welcoming, industrious people with ver very much in touch with their artistic natures. So there's kind of two sides of Guyana. One is you know, the picture postcard view. Here you see the layout of Georgetown as laid out by the Dutch uh, centuries ago. But you get down to ground level in the country, and it is far from a, a, you know, a Caribbean paradise. This is the way that many people live, I mean, within a couple miles of the, uh, of the presidential, you know, presidential uh, residence. Uh, open waterways with just about anything you can imagine floating in those waterways. A lot of people live in these kinds of conditions. So, um, and on the, other, on the other side of the street, you can kind of see on the right-hand side that there are more modern uh, living conditions. But it is a very, um, uh, still a very poor country where a lot, of, a lot of the modern conveniences do not get to the main, um, main folks. Um, and it, as I say, they are a very culturally diverse people. Here's a shot from Mash Romani, uh, an Iraq word meaning a job well done. This is their version of Independence Day. And it's a festival that combines all of the various rich cultures uh, of the Guyanese people in one uh, carnival-like like event. Um, they're also quite religious. It's one of the uh, few places I've ever been. I'm not, you know, an incredibly practiced world traveler, but within the course of a block, uh, you'll pass a, a Hindu temple, um, uh, you know, a Buddhist temple as well, Christian church and a Jewish synagogue, all within the course of, you know, a single block. So it's a um, very religious place, and it's, and it's accepting of other folks', uh, other folks systems of belief, at least in, on that level. Uh, this has contributed to Guyana's most precious product, its cultural artifacts, and its embrace of diverse individuality. For a country of its small size, it has been fertile ground for artistic creation, particularly musically. It's nurtured styles ranging from calypso, soca, chutney, shanto, Indo-Caribbean, reggae, and R&B, with artists like Bill Rogers, Bing Sarau and the Ramblers, Lord Canary, The Mighty, El Cid, Natural Black, the Yoruba Singers, and some people don't know this, but Eddie Grant uh, is a native Guyanese. It also has spawned a number of homegrown record labels, such as Hala Gala and Gems. Moreover, moreover it has a rich uh, tradition of oral storytelling, dating from its earliest indigenous people to modern day folklorists like Wordsworth McAndrew and writer archivist Peter Campadu. And sad to say, of course, there's always a dark side, a sad side to all of this. They're analog audio assets that comprise the only existing examples of much, not all, but much of the work of these folks is critically endangered. And this is where the story of the Guyana National Media Assessment Project begins. I'm sure most of you would agree, who are in this room who teach, that one of the joys of being an academic is the opportunity to work with one's former students as colleagues and have your own work enriched by their perspective on the subject you taught them. Although my background, as, as was mentioned, is uh, as a record producer engineer and now as an educator, over the years I've been introduced to previously unfamiliar, unfamiliar areas of audio, such as audio forensic, forensics, restoration, even arcane topics like steganography, solely because students expressed an interest in pursuing those topics in an independent study setting. And that's sort of how our work in Guyana began. I'll preface this uh, by saying that uh, for over 30 years, Ohio University has maintained memoranda of agreement with the University of Guyana for purposes of academic exchange, communication development, and research. My colleague, Professor Emeritus Dr. Vibert Cambridge, a native of Guyana and uh, 
a faculty within the Scripps as College of Communication where I work, has spearheaded this work. So in 2008, under Dr. Cambridge's supervision, a group of undergraduates traveled to Georgetown to assist in the video and audio documentation of Carafesta, a week-long celebration of the arts and culture of the Caribbean basin. Among these, amongst these students was Ricky Chilcott, uh, then enrolled as a student in the audio program where I teach. And over the years, Ricky and I had frequent conversations about the technical issues surrounding preservation and uh, also talked frequently about the logistics of undertaking a major archival effort, sort of in passing, but both in a, an area that both of us were quite interested in. Um, sometime later, oh, during the trip, sorry, uh, during the trip, a group of students, which included Ricky, uh, was taken on a tour of various media facilities in Georgetown. One destination was the National Communications Network of Guyana, or NCN, the government-owned and operated television and radio broadcasting system. As part of their work, they are taken to the Bertie Chancellor Library, which houses the network's audio holdings. Decades of analog audio tapes, long playing and transcription discs, cassettes, and RDATs are housed there. And as Ricky learned, they were stored under less than ideal conditions, probably not surprisingly. To his horror, he learned that recent flooding in Georgetown had destroyed a large number of the NCN holdings, and that what remained had been severely compromised by the country's subtropical climate. Combined with less than optimum storage standards, many of the tapes were in a deplorable state. Uh, here's a, a picture he took of one of them, and as you can see, this particular tape shows just about every bad condition that you have. The, the, uh, the box has uh, obviously been waterlogged. You can see evidence of mold. You see various wind issues, several tape wrap issues. Even the documentation is partial and decaying. So a couple of years later, I was invited by the University of Guyana and Canadian government to conduct a sound workshop at UG. And while in country, I had the opportunity to visit the collection once again and dig just a little bit deeper. A quick inventory revealed that there were some 11,000 estimated individual objects in the collection. I took note of some of the contents, just wrote them down briefly. I only had a limited time to, uh, to visit, the, visit the site. And uh, in my notes, I made note of many different one-of-a-kind recordings of Guyanese music, interviews with prominent public officials, speeches dating from the birth of the Republic, recordings of folk tales, weather reports, talk shows, just a very, very wide array of materials that were contained in these audio archives. And storage conditions had not much improved. I took a quick reading of the uh, temperature and humidity uh, in the archive, even though was, there was air conditioning running. It was about 85 degrees, and the uh, relative humidity was not much less than that. Upon my, here's a, just a couple shots that I took, and so as you can see, there's just nothing standard about the way this stuff is stored. Uh, tapes piled on top of each other, um, stacked inappropriately. Uh, one thing they did have going, do have going for them is that there is some cataloging system going. You can see that um, over on the right-hand side, SPE stands for speeches, EDU stands for educational or documentary content. So there is sort of a rudimentary cataloging system that moving forward, uh, we're going to be able to utilize in our, in our metadata. And here's a little closer shot of that tape, and you can clearly see some of the uh, mold infiltration in the uh, upper right sort of quadrant of the, uh, of the tape itself. So on my, on my return, I met with my colleagues to strategize how we might address the assessment and eventual archival of these assets. We realized that any preservation effort begins with proof of concept, that we need to mount a strategic inventorying and assessment of the assets in the Bertie Chancellor collection. So we decided to do the following. Develop a workflow for assessment and related tools to inventory a sampling, of, excuse me, of the Chancellor collection. To do so, we needed, we needed people to work on the project. We needed um, uh, a trained workforce. So we created a graduate level course, which was offered asynchronously to OU and UG students to teach the methods and tools that we came up with. Finally, after that was complete, the plan is to work to, uh, was to travel to, um, with our OU graduate students to Guyana to work with our counterparts to begin the assessment work. The purpose of our trip would be to establish the cultural and historical significance of the collection, to assess the condition, and make recommendations for future efforts. We sought and received funding from Ohio University's 1804 Foundation, as well as the School of Media Arts and Studies to support the project and we set out to carry out the work. Our total budget was a little over $17,000. We 
which covered the travel and accommodation of our team, which was our single, frankly, our single largest expense was just getting uh, personnel there and uh, getting them housed during the process. It also covered the purchase, design, and construction, construction of necessary equipment and other ancillary purposes. We allowed ourselves seven days in country to complete the work we set out to do. Prior to our travels to Georgetown, we knew there would be unique challenges in mounting a co coordinated and technologically robust assessment effort in, in the country. Our assessment gear would need to be portable, which because we need to get all of our material through customs uh, back and forth, um, must be easy to use, and capable of simultaneous data and photo entry. It would also need to be entirely self-contained, aside from occasional Wi-Fi hotspots, including at our accommodation in Georgetown and the University of Guyana, High-speed internet access is spotty. Rolling blackouts are a frequent problem. Um, we would not be able to rely on local servers in country because for the most part, uh, they, don't, they don't exist. So we devised assessment and capture solutions specifically for the project based on the needs of our working there. Uh, we needed to find a system that allowed a distributed team of assessors to capture photos and asset metadata and assess in a streamlined manner. It had to be intuitive and easy to use given the short turnaround time for uh, training and assessment and our short time in the country. We researched existing systems and found that many relied, some relied on unmaintained software packages, but most required full computer setups and separate cameras. These systems weren't, weren't going to cut it for us. Instead, we opted for utilizing iPads as a data entry um, uh, vehicle, which offered both convenient data entry and excellent image capture. In order to expedite assessment procedures, we designed portable rigs we called capture stands. And here are the five capture stands we designed and had, had built um, at the factory where, or the local machinists that we had them built at, on which iPads could be mounted at one end and assets at the other. It would also provide uh, consistent illumination. Here you see one of our uh, graduate students at work and you kind of see how the, the capture stand was set up. On the left-hand side, uh, you see Angie Fowler uh, entering data about the asset, which is just photographed. Uh, and all of this material is uh, contained in one uh, bit of data. And here I have with me a disassembled capture stand, which we, uh, as you can see, it's collapsible and we're able to take from site to site um, on a daily basis and also not, not coincidentally able to get through customs relatively easily. We also, uh, so you're using an iPad, what do you use for your software? Well, well we used an iOS app. Uh, the iOS app is called Form Connect. Um, and here is just a little bit of the Form Connect app. Uh, taking a picture of, there you see it mounted on a stand. And then we use the Form Connect app to use our data entry or various, the thing about Form Connect is you can customize a form for whatever types of information you'd like to enter into it. So uh, this one is not filled out, uh, but you can see that we have various types of tape and various types of real condition. I'll show you a completed uh, version of this in just a second. But you can see all, we basically uh, entered the types of things we had, we wanted our assessors to look for in the process. Um, then we had a, a Ricky, who is part of, mostly of the, handled the IT part of this, uh, design a, a open source solution, which we called Aracari, named after a Guyanese bird. Uh, so that this information could be ported to CS, CSV, XML, or JSON formats. The Form Connect documentation platform was developed using assessment standards from a variety of sources. Um, and we, of course, indebted to the great work that has been done to standardize the uh, analog assessment uh, data. We relied heavily on the standards created for the field audio collection evaluation tool, facet and sound directions from Indiana University as well as the visual and playback inspection and rating system, Vipers, developed at New York University, and of course referenced a number of research papers accessed from the Audio Engineering Society, Library of Congress, and the Smithsonian. Finally, we regularly consulted with the digital collection staff at Alden Library at Ohio University. All of these adaptions made it relatively easy to quickly capture the information and images we needed to complete the work. Uh, so prior to our leaving, we did mount a class uh, at Ohio University, and you see one of our uh, practical workshops. All of the, uh, the lecture material, which included Guyanese history, Guyanese culture, um, digital and analog technology, 
uh, assessment methods, et cetera, were cont uh, contained in this class. The class was taught asynchron asynchronously to our students in the University of Guyana with a uh, lecture capture um, platform called Panopto. And so all of our lectures were available to the students and media professionals in Guyana. We also discussed uh, current methods for preservation and restoration of analog media. Although that was outside of the purview of this project, we felt it was important that students realize the, the eventual result of the work that they were doing. Um, we then worked on the mechanics of, of evaluation. We decided to deploy five teams of two members each, consisting of one OU grad student and one Guyanese archivist. One team member was tasked with data entry and image capture, while the other was responsible for carefully handing, handling each asset, wearing gloves and, when necessary, filtration masks, uh, because many of, the, uh, many of the objects were infiltrated by mold during our, during our procedures. Um, relating all information regarding the assets, inspecting for condition, noting you know, all, all manner of uh, uh, tape uh, conditions, blocking, windowing, delamination, sticky section syndrome, et cetera, format type, material, and placing the uh, object in the capture stand for image capture. Prior to our arrival, we were made aware of several additional collections as interest in our impending visit gained momentum. Given the breadth and variety of materials contained in the various collections, we decided to expand the assessment effort to several other locations, including the National Library, Nas National Cultural Center, uh, National Archives, the Library and University of Guyana, and the audio and visual collection of the charmingly named Ministry of Culture, Youth, and Sport. We arrived in Georgetown May 6th, and the next seven days were slated for assessment. And here's our team, all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, on our first day. On the first day, we visited the various collections to be inventoried, met with various stakeholders in the project, and conducted a final workshop on the procedures for setting up the capture stand and operation of the iPad and Form Connect software. So here we are in, uh, at the University of Guyana with uh, we had 20, um, 20 folks, uh, 20 grad students, uh, media professionals, and professional archivists who took part in this portion of the class. And there we see the information transfer, one of our students, um, demonstrating the use of the capture stand. Um, another shot, a couple of those. Um, so, and, and the second day, the next very next day, our work began. Initially, assessment time per asset was a disappointing 10 to 15 minutes per asset. However, as various teams became used to the equipment and protocol and significantly to each other, efficiencies were experienced. The system ended up working pretty well. Teams eventually were able to enter data and capture images. Uh, the, the best teams could uh, assess at the rate of one every five minutes, which is a fairly, a fairly good assessment rate for a uh, project such as this. Uh, at the end of each day's assessment, our OU team, oh, here's some of our, sorry, here's some of our teams. That's Sharman Thomas from the um, University of Guyana and left, Michael Wolven, our graduate student, and this is sort of how our teams worked. One entering data, the other swapping out the, um, the guy on the left there is Birchmore Simon of Cross Color Records. This shows the, the, the level of interest we had in this in Guyana. He's one of the top record producers in Guyana who's wearing white gloves and helping us do this project. There you can see a really good shot of uh, the, of the iPad capturing imagery of, a, of an asset. And in this particular location, there, isn't, there are enough moldy assets that our team had to wear filtration masks the entire time. At the end of each day, with excellent Guyanese beer at the ready. Um, our team returned to our accommodation where we had installed our lo own local network uh, via temporary server, essentially a Mac Mini. Uh, f and Form Connect data was ported to our Akari as we, c as we put together a cumulative database. Um, we were able, during our seven days, we were able to assess a 10% a sampling of the over 14,000 estimated assets to be present in the various collections. So somewhere around 1,400 assets were, um, individual objects were assessed. One of the positive results of our assessment that we're able to confirm the presence of one-of-a-kind recordings of many uh, of many objects of historical and cultural significance, such as the swearing-in of Premier Ford's Burnham in 1964, the only known recording, uh, audio recording of this event, uh, the President's 60th birthday party in 1983, um, which is uh, something that, that hadn't been seen before, 
Uh, for me, this is quite exciting to find dozens and dozens and dozens of unreleased live and in-studio recordings of the many seminal Guyanese artists that I've already discussed, Bing, uh, Bing Sorrell, Bill Rogers, Yoruba Singers, and many others I haven't mentioned. Uh, 1972 recording of the inaugural, inaugural um, Cara Festa, important political debates, speeches by the royal family. And I have to say, to the Guyanese, the mo our most, uh, I think our most um, significant find for them was uh, uh, the discovery of the long-lost Peter Kempadu collection. Uh, Kempadu was a writer and broadcaster born in Guyana in 1926. Over his career, Kempadu amassed a sizable collection of analog recordings of indigenous dialects, folk music, Amer uh, Amerindian celebrations, folk tales, etc., etc. And this was long thought to have been lost during the tumultuous years of Guyana's independence. Um, but as a couple of our team uh, probed the depths of the University of Guyana, they came across a locked, semi-hidden closet that was behind a bunch of construction material. They opened it up, and lo and behold, there was a stack of tapes uh, bearing the mark of the Peter Kempadu collection. So uh, to the folks that we were helping out there, this was the probably our, 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 our biggest find during that era. Um, Regarding media condition, the range was extreme given the temperature and humidity uh, measurements uh, uh, that were between 76 and 86 degrees at each site with relative humidity between 49% and 80%. So as you, as you know, those of you who do this kind of work, there was, these items are being stored under deplorable conditions. Um, and uh, we found a, a wide array of conditions of tape, which I'll get to in just a second. Um, there's our... Uh, one of our measurements devices that we had at each site. At the end of it, we prepared an exit report that was given to the Minister of Culture and the Director of Culture, in which we gave them our findings um, and our recommendations. Our recommendations were the eventual digita digitization and preservation of all on analog audio assets, the creation of a purpose-built archival and reformatting space that will anticipate future media preservation needs, development of a Guyanese media preservation industry to meet future me needs at home and serve clients in the Caribbean Basin in South America. And most importantly, we felt, aside from the um, preservation and stabilization of this stuff, were avenues for public access to non-archival formats for the scholarly, historical, and cultural enrichment of Guyana and the world at large. Um, and so regarding condition, the single largest problem we found at these sites was mold infestation. Fully 40% of the objects we looked at were infested with mold. 30% with some sort of dirt or dust. 11% uh, had some sort of wind issue, uh, cupping, cinching, uh, windowing, stuff like that. Um, and, uh, and one interesting thing we found, some of you will find it, uh, of interest, is that uh, we found a lot of acetate tape, um, which was in better condition than most of the polyester tape we came across. Um, there's no, we detected very little vinegar syndrome, a little evidence of any degradation of the acetate tapes. We're not sure why that was. Our best guess is that it was all stored in cardboard, somewhat ventilated boxes, which uh, in contrast to a lot of the acetate films which are falling apart have been stored over the years in metal containers, which doesn't allow for any sort of ventilation. So, so that was one of our surprising condition finds. Um, so anyway, uh, where we're at now is that uh, after a brief delay, we recommended that uh, the government uh, procure uh, the necessary computer uh, systems in order to, for us to uh, uh, back up the work that they did. They have uh, uh, finally put that together, and we have our trained Guyanese archivist assessing the rest of the collections. We hope that this work will be done sometime in the fall. And of course, after we have a complete assessment, we'll be seeking the necessary um, financial backing and uh, technical expertise to do a full-scale stabilization, um, preservation, and eventually dis dissemination of the work. Um, in closing, you know, to many, Guyana must seem like a cultural backwater. I know for me it was before I was introduced to its lovely people, beautiful country, and its very fascinating culture, uh, not to mention its great f food and world-class rum. Um, Seriously, um, I've mentioned, uh, uh, you know, a lot of the artists I mentioned today are very likely somewhat unfamiliar uh, to some of you. I know they were to me. I hadn't heard of Bing Sorrell and the Ramblers, the Yoruba Singers, but now they're, uh, you know, they're never far from my, uh, you know, my iPod playlist nowadays when I, uh, when I listen to music. Um, 
But like all of these very, you know, there's a lot of sites around the world. We've talked a lot about, you know, the sites around the country that we're trying to preserve. Multiply that by, you know, whatever factor you'd like to multiply it by. There are tons of these little um, collections around the world that have very valuable information that we need, that we uh, will need to preserve from that. We have much to teach us and like endangered flora and fauna disappearing because of a changing climate, we never know when one of these voices has the potential to have a significant impact on our own futures. These are goals worth fighting for. I never, frankly, I never dreamed I'd become sort of a back into being an archivist. Um, but these things, as I think a lot of you know, get under your skin. And uh, so those of us at Ohio University, NUG, and um, within the government of Guyana, which, with whom we have, now have a lot of cooperation, are going to be fighting for these materials. So I, I appreciate your attention. Thank you very much.